turkey feathers. And again, turkey feathers are not illegal to have. And so the item was given back to the owner in this case. Another thing that people try to do is sell items that mimic real feathers. And this is a real red-tailed hawk feather. And this is one that was painted, a turkey feather that was painted to mimic a red-tailed hawk and an eagle. And again, the Fish and Wildlife agent thought that this was an illegal item, but when we sampled and determined that the microstructure told us it was turkey and chicken, and they were just, and you can see if you look closely that it is a painted feather, they were actually able to give that back to the owner. We've done a few uh, criminal cases with the FBI and some law enforcement agencies that involve homicides, and in this case, um, <coughs> Uh, it could either be items from a pillow or from a down jacket or from some kind of clothing or sleeping bag. Um, in this case, you can see the, the blood with all these feather fragments wrapped around it. This came from the, I think, from the face of the victim. And what you see here are those ring structures. So you have some turkey structures in here, some turkey feathers in here. And uh, also you can see that there's a triangle structure there, which is typical of ducks. And, and usually pillows and clothing are made of domesticated uh, animals, so ducks and chickens would be uh, typical of that. So what we would do then is compare that with the clothing item that was found in the um, suspect's car to determine if they were similar in nature or not. Uh, and just want to go over this project that we're working on. Uh, we often receive uh, material from ecological studies. So this is a prey remains uh, case here where we got some samples from the Burmese python, which is uh, an invasive species now in Florida. It's not native there. It was either released or escaped and now there are thousands of them in Everglades National Park and they are wreaking havoc on the native um, wildlife there. So the remains were sent to us and we worked on some of the uh, identifications. Some of the remains that we got were whole feathers that we could wash up nicely and get some characters. There's some yellow and there's some barring on that feather uh, that match up nicely with a meadowlark. And then actually sometimes the samples that we get are fresh out of the <laughs> snake's gut. And in this case, you can see there's some feet and there's some dirty feathers here that have some, uh, you know, some black tips on them. If you wash those up, you can match them nicely with a specimen of white ibis. So in all, in this part of the study, there were somewhere around 23 different species of birds and about eight orders that this snake has been preying on in Everglades National Forest. Some of them are some in, uh, endangered, federally endangered species and state-listed birds like the uh, limpkin. Um, and recently we have found egg fragments and eggshells in the uh, stomach contents of the snake. So not only are they, they, they th thought they were a sit and wait predator. And so they wait till a little bird walk by and grab it. Uh, but now it's sort of becoming obvious that they're actually seeking out uh, food from, from the nests. And finally, feathers are now being used in all kinds of fossil projects and identification projects from fossil feathers. This was a piece of amber that was in the Dominican Republic uh, Museum. And we went down there to try to help them identify the feather. But as you will see, the fluffy part that I need for identification is missing. I think it, got, I think it might have been there, just got polished off, which is unfortunate. But um, I didn't get to make an identification on that piece. We don't always get identifications from every sample that we look at. And that's all I have. So I wanted to uh, give a little bit of time here for questions if anybody has anything or you'd like to comment or um, have anything to say. Otherwise, thank you so much again for inviting me here. I'm really happy to be here.
that's a very good question. I should have gone over that better. Um, the uh, taxonomic level of identification for birds for feathers that don't have any of the whole feather, just the microstructure. Is that what you're? Yeah, that's what you're asking. I think. Yeah. Um, so it depends on it. De it depends on um, the b group of birds. So if we have a duck feather and we only have the microscopic structure, then we can usually get it to either diving duck or dabbling duck because of the number of nodes and the, the different number of, of nodes on the barbule. Then we will take the possible species of ducks that are in the area where the bird strike occurred and we can narrow it down further that way. Now if there's more than one dabbling duck in your area at this time of the year and we don't have more feathers to go out and match up the rest of the feathers with the specimen, we will stop at duck. So at least you will know if we get no DNA, and, and by the way, we do not get DNA from all of our samples. Some of them are too degraded or, or too poor to yield viable DNA, and so we do have to use the microscopic structure in those cases. And so we will stop at the family level. If we get, for example, in the eastern United States, a microscopic sample that is a swift, and we know that from the microstructure that it's that order, we only have one species of swift in the eastern U.S. So if the bird strike occurred in the eastern United States, we know it's a chimney swift. So we can get to species level in that case. So it really depends on what the bird is and where the bird strike occurred. But we get about... We do about 49% of our bird strike cases with feathers alone, with, without the DNA. The rest of them are sent to DNA, and of those, about 15 to 20% do not work. So we have to go back to the micros microscope and look at that again. Entonces, eh, pues la pregunta mía es que si, si hay algún tipo de ondas eh, que afecte como el cerebro de las aves, pues como un, un ultrasonido o un infrasonido, eh, pues que, que puedan emitir las aeronaves para pues como para alejarlos así como hacen los celulares con las moscas eh, pues algo así como como para repeler las aves y un, como un patrón de, 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 de ondas de frecuencias que, que afecten el, de algún modo el, 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 pues la audición de las aves y, y las repela gracias that's a good question too, and there are all kinds of people doing research on all aspects of bird now, everything from vision, and we had some witnesses here today tell us that different colors of airplanes may actually affect what birds, <laughs> what if birds hit them or not, and there are people working on color, there are people working on sound waves, and whether or not there's some kind of sound that can be emitted that would deter birds from aircraft or from the airfield. and. All I can tell you is that the latest uh, information on that is that it's species specific, and so some of the sounds will not be affect will not affect other species, and so you have to know what the bird is and where it is and w when it is before it could be effective. And so, I think people are still working on that and trying to figure that out. But right now, for right now, there is no um, no sound that that is being used to to scare birds away from uh, aircraft or airfields. I have a question. Do some birds learn about this? Yes, they do. I don't have the scientific evidence. Crows, for example, are very smart, and crows do not often get hit by aircraft. I don't know why. <laughs> um, the other bird that's very smart is the kite. There, apparently there are lots of kites flying around, the um, swallow-tailed kite flying around Florida airports, and 20 or 30 of them you know, can be seen flying around and they don't hit airplanes. Falcons that are trained on airfields don't get hit by aircraft, so yes. And there are also common birds are what get hit because they 
um, you know, they are the ones that are most common and they're the birds that like to hang out on flat areas in, uh, where the grass is low and they can see predators around them and they are safe. So there are only about 100 species of birds that are commonly hit. And we have only had about 300 species of birds total hit. So it is very limited, uh, if you really think about a species list. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? En el registro fósil que se ha encontrado, ¿se alcanzan a encontrar algunas de estas microestructuras en los, en los fósiles que se están encontrando en China o inclusive en el Archaeopteryx? ¿O esos fósiles no, no tienen la capacidad de preservar esas microestructuras? It's dip, very difficult to find the microscopic structures in the fossil because the fossil is, is a stone imprint usually. Now that's why the amber was such a, an important um, possibility is because the amber actually preserves the feather as it was whenever it was uh, you know, on the bird. But the, so far all of the imprints that I've looked at in stone, I have not been able to make any kind of identifications at all. ¿No podrías comentar algo más acerca de la función de esa parte plumulácea de las plumas? ¿Por qué, ¿Por qué encontramos mayor variación en esa parte que en la otra parte de las plumas? Ok. I think the reason that we find more variation in the downy part of the feather is because that part is free to track the phylogenetic uh, signal of the birds. The top part of the feather, the pinaceous part, has evolved for protection and for to allow the bird to have a coating that is that seals the body. So you have the zip, the ziplock hooklets on the pinaceous part of the feather to help protect the bird and help the bird so that it can have the airfoil and fly, and the wings will be a solid piece. The fluffy part is presumably for insulation and so it any way that it can come up with making an insulation uh, structure is fine with the bird so it doesn't have to have a uniform structure across all taxa I don't know could be could could be another reason too bueno muchas gracias muchas gracias a Carla nuevamente muchas gracias a todos ustedes por asistir thank you Nos esperamos And enjoy the rest of your talks.